Welcome everybody. This is the first TCS Plus talk of the uh, spring, even though it's full of snow outside, so I'm not quite sure I should call it spring. Um, and uh, we're very happy to have Subash, Subash Kot today. Um, Thomas Hollenstein is here uh, helping me with the organization of the TCS Plus uh, and doing all the work uh, behind the scenes. Um, Maybe uh, before we start, let me quickly introduce the audience. We have some new groups joining today. So let's see if I get it right. Uh, there's a group from uh, Purdue, uh, and uh, Akash is there, Abiram, hello, Purdue. And uh, welcome to the class. Uh, Anidia is here from uh, IES, Princeton. Hi, Anidia. Uh, we have uh, Anand Dubey from uh, ETH, the group from ETH. Hello, ETH. Uh, the group from Colombia, uh, Clement, hello. Uh, and we have uh, Grant Schoenberg, uh, hello, Michigan. Group there. Uh, who else is here? Oh, there's a new group from Berkeley, from Simon Institute, uh, James, and others, C. Elkan, welcome. Uh, the group from NYU, Yop, Daniel, hi. And um, I see the group. From the uh, and the uh, group of Cornell, hello, Sam. And that's that's it. So um, I should um, before we start, let me just uh, say the um, the next talk would be in two weeks. It's, uh, Shubangi, Shubangi, Sarat. We're going to talk about locally correctable code. And let me introduce the speaker, today's speaker. Unless I forgot something, Thomas? No, I think that's it. Uh, the speaker of today is, again, uh, Subash Kot. He's a, a professor here in uh, Courant at New York University. Uh, he graduated from uh, Princeton. He did his PhD there in 2003. Uh, he's, of course, most well-known for his uh, unique games conjecture, which I guess we also hear about today. Um, uh, he won the Waterman Award in 2010, uh, many other awards. So um, this, I guess we should uh, get to the talk. So welcome, Subash, and uh, you can start. We'll try to interrupt you with as many questions as possible. So please, everyone in the audience, please interrupt uh, Subash and make it interactive. Uh, so uh, please, Subash. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, so let me thank the organizers first uh, for inviting me to give this talk, and in particular to Thomas and Odith for making sure that uh, uh, it's working uh, fine uh, in terms of technology, at least so far so good. Uh, so uh, you all hear me properly, right? Yeah, we hear perfectly well. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so let's start. Uh, so I'm going to talk about... Uh, 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 approximation resistance of predicates. Uh, this is joint work with Madhur Tulsiani and Pratik Vora. And uh, do stop me uh, whenever you want. Uh, so here is overview for the talk. Uh, so fair amount of uh, 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 initial portion of the talk will be introduction and uh, survey of the known results. Uh, the result itself, uh, which is the characterization of approximation resistant predicates, uh, this is a bit, uh, uh, it's a bit difficult to even state the result. Uh, and uh, it will be good to have uh, uh, some basics, uh, both from the algorithmic side and the hardness side. Uh, and the result itself is a, uh, is a classification of predicates. Uh, predicates for which there is a good algorithm versus the predicates for which uh, these are hard to approximate. Uh, and then some concluding remarks. Uh, so we'll talking about uh, constraint satisfaction problems, or CSPs. Uh, these will be over Boolean domain, uh, meaning the variables are plus and minus one valued. Uh, all constraints will be of the same type, uh, and variables are allowed to appear in negated form. Uh, so the most uh, famous example is uh, 3SAT. So you, every constraint is OR of three uh, variables, and variables are allowed to be negated. Uh, another example is uh, where uh, every constraint is of the form uh, Xi not equal to Xj. Uh, and this you can think of as uh, finding uh, a cut cut in the graph uh, where the variables are vertices and edges are uh, the constraints. 
Uh, yet another example is where the three XOR, where uh, uh, the constraints are linear equations modulo two. Uh, but since the variables are plus or minus one, uh, linear equation is really uh, saying that product of three variables is plus one, uh, or the product of three variables is uh, minus one. Uh, now, if the right hand side of an equation is minus one, you can pick one of the three variables on the left hand side and negate it, right? Uh, and uh, uh, so without loss of generality, you can assume that every equation uh, has the same type, which is the product of three literals uh, is plus one. Uh, so in general, uh, you can consider such a CSP uh, with respect to any fixed uh, predicate. Uh, so let F be a predicate, meaning it's a map from uh, k-bit strings to 0, 1. Uh, so it's a predicate of arity k. And the strings which map to 1, uh, these are thought of as uh, the satisfying assignments uh, to the predicate. right? Uh, and then each constraint is... Uh, of course, there are uh, Boolean variables and constraints, and each constraint is this predicate uh, f uh, applied to some ordered list of uh, k variables, and the variables are allowed to appear negated. So a typical constraint would look like this, right? So f applied to some ordered set of variables, uh, and some of the variables could be negated. Um, and we want to think of the arity of the predicate, which is k, uh, as fixed constant, uh, such as uh, for 3SAT, uh, its uh, the arity is 3, right? And then it's really the number of variables and constraints, uh, which is the input size, which, uh, which tends to infinity. Uh, one way to think about an instance of such a CSP uh, is uh, as a hypergraph, where the variables represent vertices, and each constraint represents uh, a hyperedge. Uh, so here it is uh, uh, CSP of uh, arity 3, right? So each edge has size uh, 3. Uh, uh, but of course, this picture is, uh, uh, is hiding some information, such as uh, within a hyper edge, uh, there is, there is a, some ordering of the variables. And also the variables, they are allowed to be negated. Right, uh, so this information is not shown in the picture, uh, but still, it's good to think of the instance as a hypergraph. Now, uh, uh, yeah, and everything uh, will be with respect to some fixed predicate f, right? Now, uh, uh, given such an instance, you can ask two questions, the satisfiability question and uh, approximability question. Uh, so the satisfiability question asks, uh, given an instance of such a CSP, uh, 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 can you find, uh, which is completely satisfiable, meaning uh, uh, there is an assignment which satisfies all constraints, uh, can, you, can you find a satisfying assignment, right? And the famous dichotomy theorem of uh, Schaeffer, uh, it shows that uh, for every predicate F, the corresponding CSP, uh, which we'll start denoting by CSP, in bracket f. Uh, for every predicate f, such a CSP is either in p uh, or is uh, np hard. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. So, what if we had allow two types of predicates? Are the things still the same or the different? Uh, 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 so, uh, well, uh, well, for instance, uh, in uh, for the Schaeffer's case, uh, he will still, uh, his theorem will hold for even for mix of predicates. And uh, whatever result I will talk about, uh, we, we didn't do it in our paper, uh, but uh, it can be extended to mix of predicates. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So, so much can you have like individual predicates that are in P, but their mixture would be on the in P hard? Uh, I believe so, yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, so uh, the satisfiability question, uh, well, we are going to think of as being settled, uh, uh, and it's really the approximability question that uh, we will focus on. And even this question, you can study in more generality, uh, but we are going to focus on one specific scenario where you are given an instance which is 
uh, almost satisfiable right uh, meaning there is an assignment which satisfies 99.999% uh, of the constraints right almost all the constraints uh, and then uh, again the question is how good an assignment uh, can you find uh, efficiently so here is a simple observation to start with uh, so let rho of f uh, denote the density of the predicate which is the number of satisfying assignments to the predicate divided by 2 to the k uh, so f inverse of 1 uh, that's uh, the set of satisfying assignments right uh, so this rho of f this is uh, the probability that if you assign random values to the variables in a constraint is the probability that the constraint will be satisfied so clearly for 3 sat the density is uh, 7 over 8 for the 3 xor predicate the density is uh, 1 half uh, and it's clear that uh, given an instance of a CSP, uh, if I allow, uh, if I assign random Boolean values to the variables independently, uh, I will satisfy uh, row of f uh, fraction of the constraints, right? Uh, uh, so, and that's a, that's a, that's one algorithm uh, which comes up with an assignment satisfying uh, row of f uh, fraction of the constraints. But it's a trivial algorithm, so uh, so I would like to have an algorithm which is uh, strictly better than this trivial algorithm, and that's really what this notion of approximation resistance is about. Okay, so uh, so we have the predicate f, uh, rho of f is the density, uh, and then the predicate is called approximable if uh, there is a non-trivial algorithm, uh, or specifically there is some fixed positive constant epsilon uh, and an efficient algorithm which uh, given one minus epsilon uh, satisfiable instance uh, it out it comes up with an assignment which is uh, rho of f plus epsilon satisfying right so clearly uh, as we saw you can always find an assignment which is rho of f satisfying and then the predicate is approximable if you can beat it by uh, some uh, uh, positive uh, additive constant epsilon right uh, so I hope the definition is clear uh, so these are approximable predicates uh, and otherwise uh, a predicate is called approximation uh, resistant right meaning uh, there is no algorithm efficient algorithm which is better than the trivial algorithm and just as kind of uh, uh, kind of quick results uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 to uh, introduce uh, this notion uh, Gomans and Williamson uh, they proved that uh, 2 sat and 2 xor uh, these are approximable uh, so the Gomans Williamson paper uh, is more famously known for the max cut problem uh, but basically the same algorithm really works uh, uh, if you think of as algorithm for 2 sat or 2 xor on the other hand, Hastad showed that uh, for every k greater or equal to 3, uh, k sat and k xor, uh, these are uh, approximation uh, resistant. Uh, so now, uh, it's clear that if you want to show that a predicate is approximable, you want to design an algorithm. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to show that a predicate is approximation resistant, uh, what you would like to do is uh, to show that uh, for every positive epsilon, uh, it is NP hard to distinguish uh, whether a given instance is 1 minus epsilon satisfiable or at most uh, rho of f plus epsilon satisfiable, right? And this for every positive epsilon, every positive constant epsilon. Uh, now, ideally, we would like to show that this is this task is NP hard, uh, but uh, we are going to settle for uh, the notion of uh, UG hardness or the unique games hardness. Uh, which is same as saying the unique games, uh, the NP hard assuming the unique games conjecture. Uh, so I'm not going to state what the unique games conjecture is, uh, uh, but uh, we will more or less take the unique games conjecture for granted uh, in this talk. Uh, and the notion of hardness is uh, the unique games hardness, right? Uh, so this is what approximation uh, resistance means. Uh, or to be even kind of more uh, concrete, uh, what we would like to do is uh, to give a reduction from uh, the a hard problem, in, in this case the unique games problem, to the promise gap version of this uh, CSP problem, right? So we want a reduction to the promise problem where 
the instance of the CSP is guaranteed to be either 1 minus epsilon satisfiable or at most rho of f plus epsilon satisfiable for every value of epsilon. Uh, we want to give such a reduction, right? And then the predicate will be uh, approximation resistant. Uh, and as I said, uh, this notion of resistance, it captures the idea that it's hard to beat or do better than a random assignment algorithm. Okay, so I hope uh, this was clear. Uh, so here is a quick overview of known results. Uh, so as I said, Hastad showed that Ksat and Kxor are resistant uh, for K greater or equal to 3. Uh, and it turns out that uh, these, these results, which show that certain predicates are resistant, uh, they also have many more applications uh, to problems which are not, uh, not even CSPs to begin with. Uh, uh, and I will mention these applications as well. So in particular, uh, you can take this result of Hasta then use gadget reductions uh, to, show, to show best known hardness for uh, many more problems, uh, in particular for 2SAT and for uh, MaxCut. Uh, Samordansky and Trevisan, they showed that a certain predicate called graph linearity test is uh, resistant. Uh, so I want to write down the predicate here because uh, the next slide is going to describe uh, a more general predicate. Uh, but I will say that this result gives an alternate proof of uh, Hastad's result that uh, click on n-vertex graphs uh, is hard to approximate within factor uh, n to the 1 minus epsilon. Uh, Guru Swami, Hastad and Sudan, uh, they showed that the not all, predic not all equal predicate on 4 bits is approximation resistant. So this is a predicate which looks at the 4 bits and uh, uh, it accepts if uh, not all four bits are equal in value. And using this, uh, they show that it's hard to color uh, two colorable, four uniform hypergraphs with any constant number of colors. Uh, so it has application to these coloring, uh, coloring results. Uh, and finally, Samordansky, Trevisan, and Chan, uh, they show that hypergraph linearity test predicate uh, is uh, resistant. Uh, so, uh, so throughout this talk, uh, you will see uh, some of these results or papers are marked by a star sign. Uh, so, star means it's a result based on unique games, and uh, otherwise it's an NP hardness result. So, here Samurdansi and Trevisan proved this result under the unique games conjecture, but now Chan has a, a NP hardness result. Uh, now, well, he, the Definition of the predicate appears here, but it's a bit complicated to state. Uh, so let me just skip it and just say that it's a predicate where uh, uh, it's a predicate which is the which is kind of the most general way in which you can test whether a given function is a linear function. So it's really a predicate that arises in linearity testing. Uh, uh, so another way to think about the predicate is that uh, the uh, satisfying assignments of the predicate are really the truth tables of the Hadamard code, okay? Uh, uh, and what is important about this predicate is that uh, 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 it's a KRE predicate uh, with very few satisfying assignments. So it has only K plus one satisfying assignments, okay? Uh, and the point is that even by having such few assignments, uh, it's still approximation resistant. And it has many more applications. Uh, so it gives optimal hardness for max KCSP problem. It leads to uh, results saying uh, that independent set on degree D graphs for, for think of D as a constant. Uh, these are hard to approximate within factor D over polylog D, uh, which is optimal up to the exponent in the polylog D factor. Uh, it leads to results saying it's hard to color k colorable graphs with uh, 2 to the k to the 1 3rd colors. Uh, this is a result of Huang. Uh, and finally, uh, for a very canonical useful problem called label cover with k labels, uh, it leads to hardness of 1 over square root k. Uh, yeah, so I don't want to get into these results in any detail, but I just wanted to point out that uh, we have many more applications to uh, non-CSP problems. Uh, and uh, uh, and actually, uh, uh, last almost 15, 20 years, uh, we have spent a lot of effort in showing that uh, specific predicates are uh, approximation resistant. Uh, and now, uh, uh, what we want to do is uh, uh, 
uh, is to completely characterize uh, which predicates are approximation resistant and which are not. Uh, or to give a condition uh, which is fairly easy to state condition uh, uh, which is both necessary and sufficient uh, for a predicate to be approximation resistant. Uh, so let me give some uh, uh, overview of uh, prior results. Uh, so Hasta and Zwick, they showed, uh, they gave a classification uh, for predicates of arity 3. Uh, so in particular, they showed that predicate of arity 3 is resistant uh, if and only if it is implied by the 3XOR predicate uh, up to negating variables. Uh, Hast, uh, he obtained a partial classification uh, for predicates of arity 4. Uh, so out of uh, 400 such predicates, uh, he classified 79 to be resistant, 275 to be uh, not resistant, uh, and then the remaining, their status was uh, left open. So, Subhash, so what is implied? What, what do you mean by predicate on three variables being implied by 3XOR? Yeah, implied meaning uh, you can take 3XOR, so it has four satisfying assignments, uh, and then you can add more assignments are satisfying arbitrarily. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Hello? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's a superset of uh, six all. Yeah, exactly. And then for the trivial, um, the trivial one where everything is accepted and it's kind of trivially approximating the reason, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, this result of Chan that I mentioned, uh, uh, it actually gives a sufficient condition for resistance. So what it shows is that if you look at the set of satisfying assignments, which is F inverse 1, uh, then it's a subgroup of uh, the whole group, which is plus 1, minus 1 to the K, right? Plus, minus 1 to the K, you want to think of it as a vector space uh, of dimension K. And then if the set of satisfying assignments uh, is a subgroup, uh, and it needs to be non-degenerate subgroup, meaning uh, uh, if you look at any two coordinates out of the k coordinates, uh, then they are pairwise independent, okay? Uh, meaning no one coordinate is fixed to uh, some fixed value, and no two coordinates are always identical, okay? So up to this uh, kind of non-degeneracy, uh, then if the set of satisfying assignments is a subgroup, then uh, the predicate is uh, resistant. Okay, that's a sufficient condition. Now earlier, uh, Austrian and Mossel, uh, they had obtained an even more general uh, sufficient condition. Well, except that uh, you notice a star there. So that's under uh, unique games conjecture. Uh, so their condition is that, uh, that there is a pairwise independent distribution, balanced and pairwise independent distribution, uh, which is supported on the set of satisfying assignments, uh, F inverse 1, uh, right? Uh, so if you can find a pairwise independent distribution supported on set of satisfying assignments, uh, then the predicate is resistant. Uh, so in particular, in chance result, which is the earlier result, that distribution will be simply uniform on a uh, set of satisfying assignments, right? So therefore, this austrian mosel condition is more general. Uh, but still, uh, this austrian mosel condition is, uh, uh, is not, it's not necessary, it's sufficient. Uh, and then there are more ad hoc conditions known, but uh, this austrian mosel is the one which is fairly general and pretty nice to state. Uh, uh, Subhash? Yeah. Uh, I have a question. So yeah. uh, does Schaffer's characterization of NP hardness, does it also give a necessary and sufficient condition? Or right. does it just state there's a dichotomy? Uh, no, no. So Schaeffer's, Schaeffer's result, it actually makes a list of the predicates which are in P. And it's a very short uh, list. Uh, it basically it consists of two sat and the linear predicates, more or less. Okay. Okay. It's a very short list. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, finally, uh, so last year, Austrian and myself, uh, we did have the complete classification or characterization of predicates, uh, but in a restricted scenario where uh, the predicates are required to be even, uh, so I will skip the defi definition, uh, but more importantly, we only focused on the case where the instances are k-partite, meaning uh, 
uh, you can partition the variables into k layers uh, such that every constraint has its first variable from the first layer, second variable from the second layer, and so on. Okay, uh, so it was some restricted scenario, uh, but there we did have a, a classification, complete classification. Okay, and uh, then the, the the result of this talk, which we will get to towards almost the end of the talk, is that we do have a complete classification now. Uh, but before that, uh, let's look at some basics uh, first from the algorithmic side. Uh, so, uh, so here is a kind of quick uh, reminder or a review of the Gomans Williamson's uh, semi-definite programming relaxation for the max cut problem. Uh, so, max cut. Uh, we know that uh, you you have you have a graph and you want to find a cut in the graph which maximizes the uh, fraction of the edges cut. So we can write down this uh, write this down as uh, integer linear program where uh, uh, I have uh, variables x1, x2 up to x sub n which are plus or minus one and the ith variable denotes uh, whether the vertex is on the plus side of the cut or the minus side of the cut. Uh, and then if you look at this expression one minus xi xj over two, it is one or zero depending on whether uh, uh, whether the edge ij is cut or not cut. Uh, and therefore, this expression which appears there, it's precisely the fraction of the edges which are cut. And then you want to maximize this over all Boolean assignments. Uh, now, this is just a reformulation of the max cut problem. So this is still NP hard problem. Uh, but then you can take its uh, semi-definite programming relaxation, uh, which simply amounts to allowing these variables x size to instead of taking values plus or minus one uh, you allow them to take values which are uh, unit vectors uh, unit vectors in arbitrarily high dimension uh, so plus or minus one these are thought of as unit vectors in a single dimension uh, but now i allow them to be uh, high arbitrarily high dimensional vectors so now I have vectors v1, v2 up to v sub n, and I want to maximize uh, the same expression, uh, except that uh, the, the product xi, xj is now replaced by the inner product of the vectors v sub i and v sub j. Okay, so I want to find n unit vectors uh, so as to maximize this expression. And this is a semi-definite program. Uh, it can be solved in polynomial time. Uh, and then Gomans and Williamson give uh, what is known as a rounding algorithm, which uh, which uh, takes these uh, vectors and uh, actually uh, rounds them to uh, Boolean values, uh, which gives a cut. Uh, and then they show that it's approx it is an approximately uh, good uh, cut in the graph. Okay. Uh, and we'll see uh, how the rounding works. Uh, but this is what is done for the max cut. Uh, and turns out that you can write down a similar semi-definite programming relaxation for any any CSP. Okay, so, uh, so just to recall, uh, we have CSPs uh, with respect to some fixed predicate uh, F, right? And also note that we only care about instances of CSPs which are uh, near satisfiable or let's even say perfectly satisfiable for the sake of simplicity. Because our goal is to, given a near satisfiable instance, how good an assignment can we find, right? So we are going to assume that the instance is more or less satisfiable. Uh, yeah, so let the variables be x1 through xn, constraints be c1 through c sub m, and the instances, uh, as we noted, uh, is represented by this uh, hypergraph. Uh, so I will, uh, I will say how the, SDP looks like, uh, but uh, before that, uh, here is a small piece of notation. So henceforth, uh, mu is going to denote uh, a distribution uh, on the set of satisfying assignments of the predicate, which we already saw is denoted as f inverse one. Okay, so this is what mu will be henceforth. Uh, it's a distribution supported on set of satisfying assignments, and then once you fix mu. Uh, you can look at the second moments of this distribution and uh, call them mu sub ij, right? So uh, there are k choose two such second moments. For any pair of coordinates i and j, you look at uh, expected value of uh, uh, z sub i, z sub j, where z is a string which is drawn from this distribution mu. Okay, so these are simply the second moments. Uh, 
So can I ask a question? Yeah. So I mean, f the the predicate in principle you can uh, apply on literals, and the literals may be negated, right? But f to the minus of one, this is just the distribution is is without any negation or something. Yeah. So uh, so the negations are usually handled by some small trick in the PCP literature, and uh, so just forget about the negations. Oh, okay. M more or less. Okay. Uh, they really play no essential role as such. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. And now, uh, now I am going to show uh, how the SDP looks like for uh, for a CSP such as this. Uh, now I am not really going to write down the SDP explicitly because that's a bit uh, tedious. Uh, but I will tell you how the SDP solution looks like. Uh, it's going to be a bit more, uh, bit more general than the uh, than the case of MaxCut. Okay, so uh, again to emphasize, mu is a distribution supported on satisfying assignments. Uh, you have the second moments, uh, 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 and you have this uh, instance of the CSP, right? Now uh, uh, the SDP solution. Uh, is uh, is again going to have these unit vectors uh, for each variable, just like max cut, right? So, for instance, uh, the picture shows a vector called v1 corresponding to ve variable x1, vector v2, and vector v3 uh, corresponding to variables x2 and x3, and these are unit vectors. Now, in addition, uh, and this is unlike max cut. So, in addition, uh, there is this distribution mu. Uh, for every constraint. So if you look at the picture, uh, it shows this distribution mu uh, for this one particular constraint on variables x1, x2, and x3, right? Uh, so this mu uh, is called uh, a local distribution, okay? So that's a phrase I'm going to use, local distribution. Uh, so it's just a distribution on satisfying assignments, and the word local refers to the fact that it's local to that particular constraint, uh, meaning uh, for every constraint C, there is one such mu, okay? And uh, this mu will change uh, uh, depending on what constraint you are looking at. Uh, but it's always a uh, distribution supported on satisfying assignments. Okay, so that makes sense. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, and then uh, there is a consistency between the vectors and these local distributions. Okay, so I have to tell you uh, what these consistency conditions are. Uh, so the yeah, basically the point is that uh, the second moments of these local distributions they are precisely equal to the inner product between these vectors. Okay, so in particular, let's focus on this constraint which is shown in the picture. Uh, so it's a constraint on three variables, x1, x2, x3. There is this local distribution mu. Uh, then uh, mu has uh, three uh, pairwise uh, moments, right? There is a moment between coordinate number one and two. Uh, there is a moment between, or the correlation between uh, uh, variable two and three, and there is a correlation between variable one and three. And then these pairwise correlations, uh, which are mu sub ij, they are precisely equal to the inner product uh, vi sub vj, right? Uh, so, for instance, the, the 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 moment between coordinates one and two, it will be equal to the inner product of vector v1 and v2. Okay, so I hope uh, this was clear. Uh, and of course, this holds for uh, every constraint. Uh, so that's what uh, the SDP solution looks like. So is mu yeah. part of the solution or part of the uh, instance of the SDP? No, no. Mu is part of the solution. So, so you saw you saw some you saw some SDP relaxation, and this is what the SDP relaxation outputs as a solution. Mu is different for each constraint. And mu is different for different constraints. Yes. Uh, that's yeah, why that's it is called. Part. That's why it is called local. So these are extra linear programming constraints, right? That make sure that the mu ij. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are some linear programming constraints which make sure that all this works out. Okay, so of course we are not writing down the actual program. Okay, but that's a that's rather tedious. Okay, so uh, should we proceed? 
Okay, so uh, yeah, so now this is what the SDP solution looks like, and now uh, how do we round it? Uh, and turns out that the rounding is fairly, uh, uh, in some sense, standard. Uh, so, so if you know how the max cut is rounded, uh, it basically amounts to projecting vectors on a single dimension, which is the line, and then uh, uh, the line has a positive part and the negative part, the real line. And if the vector falls on the projection falls on the positive side, you round the variable as plus one. If it falls on the negative side, you round it as minus one, right? Uh, which is act, which is same as the hyperplane rounding that you might be more familiar with. Okay, so that's that's what happens in the case of max cut. And now we do something rather similar. Uh, we have these uh, vectors, uh, right? Uh, v1 up to vn. Uh, we randomly project them down on some subspace. Uh, let's say d-dimensional subspace R to the d, uh, and th you want to think of d as uh, uh, a constant, but might be a large constant, maybe 100. Let's say, okay. Right? So you project the uh, vectors on a random d-dimensional subspace, uh, and let's say the vector v sub i it gets mapped to vector y sub i in this projected space, uh, and now you decide a priori uh, upon a certain partition of the space uh, r to the d, right? In the case of max cut, it is the partition of the line on the positive axis and the negative axis. Uh, but in general, you can decide upon arbitrary partition of the space uh, r to the d. Okay. So this will be represented by a function called rounding function uh, psi. So psi is a function on r to the d, which is plus or minus one valued, right? And then uh, simply depending on where this projection uh, fail whether on the positive side or the negative side of the partition you round the variable to either plus one or minus one okay so that's what the rounding is uh, so just to kind of again emphasize xi is the original variable vi is the sdp vector uh, yi is its projection on random d dimensional subspace and then you finally round it to the value psi of yi right which is now a boolean value and this is how the rounding works uh, now, uh, now, now this is one potential algorithm, right? And one potential rounding method. Uh, and actually, it turns out that, uh, uh, in fact, this is the most general algorithm, uh, which is which is quite uh, 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 which is quite a striking result. And this is a result of Raghavendra, uh, who showed that, uh, uh, as far as CSPs are concerned. Uh, this is the most general algorithm in the sense that uh, 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 modulo the unique games conjecture, uh, uh, there is always an algorithm of this kind which achieves the optimal uh, optimal performance or optimal uh, approximation ratio. Okay, and here the only cleverness is in coming up with uh, this rounding function called psi, right? Because uh, the rounding function psi that's the only part which is uh, I haven't explicitly stated what it is. Everything else is explicit, uh, right? It's always the same. And it's only the choice of the rounding function psi uh, which really matters or which is the clever, the part where you need some cleverness. Okay, so uh, yeah, so, uh, so in some sense we know what the algorithm is. It's simply coming up with this rounding function, okay? Uh, so this is all I want to say from the viewpoint of uh, Algorithm. Now we move to the uh, new point. Yeah. Uh, yeah just just uh, one remark. That, that, yeah. Uh, you actually never use the muse in the rounding. You just. Uh, yeah, I in some sense didn't use, uh, but they are kind of hidden in some manner. Right. Okay. Okay. So now some preliminaries from the hardness side. Uh, uh, so as we saw, the hardness amounts to giving a reduction from some known hard problem. Let's say the unique games problem. Uh, and these are really constructions of what are known as probabilistically checkable proofs or PCPs. Uh, but let's just think of these as standard reductions. Uh, and uh, there will be gadgets, just as is common in most of the reductions. And in this co in this context, the gadgets amount to what are known as uh, dictatorship tests. Uh, so what is a dictatorship test? Uh, so this is a test to check that uh, a given Boolean function is a is a dictatorship function. Uh, so what is a dictatorship function? Uh, 
so function g uh, so it's a boolean function from n dimensions to a boolean set it's a declaration function if its value on any input it's simply the ith coordinate for some fixed i okay so that's what boolean uh, dictatorship functions are now i would like to emphasize that this function g which we want to test it's something completely different from the predicate f okay so that's why it has a different name g and we want to test uh, whether a function is a dictatorship function uh, now of course this predicate f uh, has to somehow play a role uh, so this predicate f is fixed and also we are going to fix some local distribution mu uh, so it's a distribution mu supported on the set of satisfying assignments okay and now fix f and mu and we want to test that uh, there is some function g uh, we want to test that it's a dictatorship function uh, now here is the slide in text but uh, maybe it's better to do with a picture uh, uh, so here is how the test is going to work uh, so pick a random k cross n uh, uh, a boolean matrix so just to recall k is the arity of the predicate and n is the dimension of the function g right uh, that's the function you want to test uh, is a dictator uh, so here is how the test works so i sam i randomly select this matrix by selecting each column uh, independently and each column is a random satisfying assignment of the predicate okay so note that the, the length of the column is k which is precisely the arity of the predicate uh, so each column is a random satisfying assignment of the predicate uh, but it's sampled from this distribution mu right uh, mu is the distribution on the satisfying assignments uh, so you sample each column independently construct this matrix uh, now apply the function g that's the function you want to test on each row okay and when i say apply what i really mean is uh, go and look up the value of this function uh, yeah, in the in its truth table right uh, so apply the function g on each of the k rows so you will get this uh, extra column on the right hand side which is the g applied on row 1 g applied on row 2 blah 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 up to g applied on row k right so think of as one extra column which is the output column um, and then you accept if the output column is also a satisfying assignment of the predicate okay so this is how the test works uh, so there was a slide before uh, where I just uh, wrote down uh, this in text, uh, but uh, but I already described this by picture, so let's skip that. Uh, so this is what the dictatorship test is. Uh, now we want to show that uh, the test has completeness and the soundness. Uh, so completeness means if the function is indeed a dictatorship, then the test accepts with uh, probability one. Uh, and this is kind of clear from uh, from uh, from the design of the test right because if the function is a dictator then uh, the value of the function is simply the ith coordinate for some fixed i and therefore the output column the last extra column is going to be identical to the ith column right and since every column is what chosen to be a satisfying assignment the output column is a satisfying assignment and therefore the test accepts with probability one okay uh, so it's really the soundness uh, which needs more work and it can be shown that if the function is far from being a dictatorship in some precise sense that i won't describe uh, then the following properties hold firstly uh, that the acceptance probability of the test uh, it depends only on the second moments of the distribution mu okay so just to recall the test is with respect to some the fixed predicate f and fixed uh, uh, local distribution mu okay and uh, even though uh, uh, well mu is a distribution so it has higher moments also uh, but the acceptance probability of the test uh, it depends only on the second moments of the of, of the mu uh, that's important uh, and then it turns out that depending on what the predicate is uh, it's possible to choose mu appropriately so that the test accepts with probability at most uh, rho of f plus uh, little o1 uh, and rho of f uh, is thought of as some sort of trivial acceptance probability uh, even a random function will be accepted with probability rho of f okay uh, so sometimes it's possible uh, to design a test like this whose acceptance probability is upper bounded by essentially uh, rho of f which is the density of the predicate and uh, you can make the test bit more general by uh, choosing mu itself from 
from some prior uh, distribution, right? So you first sample mu and then uh, run the whole test uh, with respect to mu, okay? Uh, and then you can uh, look at the acceptance, overall acceptance probability. Uh, and then uh, here is one way to state our final characterization of approximation resistance. That a predicate is approximation resistant if and only if it is possible to design a test like this uh, whose acceptance probability here in the soundness case is upper bounded by uh, rho of f plus little o1. Okay, so that's one way to state the characterization. Uh, but then finally we are going to state it in a somewhat different uh, language. Uh, but just to give some uh, uh, some head start. Uh, and these uh, this this proving these properties requires that the uh, very nice invariance principle. Uh, uh, this um, uh, this was there was a version proved by Rothar in 70s, and then uh, there are more uh, kind of computer science uh, oriented uh, useful versions by uh, Mosel, O'Donnell, Oleshkiewicz, uh, Mosel, uh, and Chatterjee. Uh, so that's the background from the hardness side. Uh, and now we will start uh, state the characterization. Uh, uh, so before that, let me quickly say that Raghavendra and Steurer, they already gave a character sort of a characterization in a rather loose sense. So what they showed is the following. Uh, so Raghavendra showed that the notion of unique game's hardness is equivalent to the notion of uh, integrality gap. Uh, and therefore, a predicate is resistant if and only if uh, for every epsilon, there exists uh, 1 minus epsilon versus uh, rho of f plus epsilon uh, integrality gap instance. Uh, so if you're not familiar with integrality gaps, uh, you, you can ignore this uh, slide. Uh, uh, and Raghavendra and Stroyer shows that for every epsilon, uh, you can actually determine uh, whether uh, there is such an integrality gap instance uh, in time doubly exponential in 1 over epsilon. Uh, and this is more or less by brute force search over all CSP instances of uh, certain size, of size uh, which is exponential in 1 over epsilon. Uh, and then uh, for every epsilon, in decreasingly small values of epsilon, uh, you can keep checking whether there are these integrality gap instances. And that gives uh, recursively enumerable uh, uh, condition uh, to check whether predicate is approximation resistant. Uh, but then uh, this is, uh, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't really call this as a characterization of resistance. Uh, uh, in particular, it doesn't tell me what are the proper intrinsic properties of the predicate, uh, which leads to these gap instances or approximation resistance, uh, uh, because the search is really brute force. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, it doesn't tell whether uh, the predicate is hard, because of some intrinsic properties of the predicate, or maybe because of some sort of external properties, such as uh, maybe the predicate is hard because the CSP instances, when viewed as hypergraphs, uh, that hypergraphs are expanders, right? Who knows? Maybe is the structure of the hypergraphs that matters. Uh, but as we will see, it's really some intrinsic properties of the predicate uh, which make the predicate approximation resistant. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So uh, the characterization you're going to give, is it going to be efficiently computable or say recursively enumerable? No, it won't be decidable, but it will, it will, won't be decidable, but it will be recursively enumerable. Okay. okay. So, uh, yeah. uh, so just from this perspective, like yeah. uh, it is conceivable that the Raghavendra story result to you, uh, yeah. this algorithm that they give, yeah. uh -huh. uh, this actually converges. The best integrality gap instance is actually finite. Uh, uh, there is no, no, no. So what that what that will amount to saying is that, uh, let's say a predicate of arity k, suppose it's approximable, right? Meaning there is an algorithm which does better than the density. Okay. Then if suppose you showed that if there is an algorithm, then it does better than the density by an amount, which is some some explicit thing depending on the arity. Suppose you come up with a bound like that. Okay. Then the Raghavendra Stoyer, uh, 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 their condition will become decidable. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, but uh, right now it's not, and our characterization is not decidable either. Okay. But as you will see, our characterization is rather explicit. Okay. Okay. Uh, you will see. 
Uh, okay, so now I guess I'm kind of running out of time. I believe I have 10 minutes. So I will try to at least state the characterization. Okay, uh, Because this whole online thing is, uh, uh, I try to be very slow so that I'm audible and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, okay. You should feel free to take some uh, some more time. Yeah. It's perfectly okay. Uh, but I guess in 10 minutes I will at least be able to state the characterization. Uh, so let's start. Uh, so here is another bit of notation. So as I said, mu is the uh, local distribution, right? Uh, supported on satisfying assignments. Uh, now let let us denote by uh, zeta of mu uh, the vector of uh, first and second moments of uh, mu. Right, so it's a vector of dimension k plus k choose two, the k first moments and k choose two second moments. Uh, now it turns out that also the the first moments are also important, uh, though before I tried to pretend as if uh, only the second moments are important, uh, but both first and second moments are important. Uh, okay, so let zeta of mu denote this vector of first and second moments, uh, and let uh, c of f uh, denote the convex polytope uh, defined as follows. So for any mu supported on the set of satisfying assignments of the predicate, uh, let zeta of mu be this vector of first and second moments, uh, and let uh, c of f be the uh, be the be the body which is a set of all such vectors zeta of mu. Okay. Now it's not immediately clear, but it's pretty easy to show that it's a very nice uh, convex uh, bounded nice convex polytope. Okay. Uh, in dimensions k plus uh, k choose two. Okay, so that's what this polytope is, uh, C of f, uh, which clearly it depends purely on the predicate. Uh, and then uh, this austrian mosel condition, the sufficient condition for approximation resistance, uh, it can be now stated in a this different new language that a predicate is resistant if the point which is all zeros, uh, it is in this uh, polytope. Right, because their condition was that uh, there is a distribution which is pairwise independent, okay, supported on the predicate. Uh, now, if you have a distribution mu which is pairwise independent, then if you look at its first and second moments, they are all zero, right? So the corresponding vector zeta of mu uh, is really the all zeros vector. So there, if the all zeros vector uh, is in this polytope, uh, then the predicate is resistant. Okay, so this is simply the austrian mosel condition uh, stated in this new language. And uh, clearly our condition, which is now both necessary and sufficient, uh, will be a generalization of this austrian mosel condition. And the condition is going to look like this, that uh, there is a probability major lambda on this polytope C of f, which has certain symmetry properties. Okay. Uh, now I have to tell you what symmetries are allowed. Uh, so let's look at the set of symmetries. There are three symmetries which are allowed. Uh, so fix a point zeta in this body. Uh, so it's really simply a vector of uh, length k plus k choose two, right? The k first moments followed by k choose two second moments. Uh, so fix a point zeta, point or the vector. And now you are allowed to transform this vector in three ways. Firstly, you can arbitrarily permute the underlying k variables, right? Uh, so you permute the k variables. Uh, so this will lead to corresponding permutation of the first moments. And uh, it will induce permutation on the pairs also, right? So the second moments, uh, they will also get permuted, OK? Uh, so if you have a permutation pi, uh, you get this new vector, uh, right? Uh, by permuting the second, first and second moments. Uh, next, you are allowed to multiply each coordinate by a plus or a minus sign. Okay, uh, so you can multiply the ith variable by the sign b sub i. Okay, and that will uh, lead to uh, uh, the first moments will get multiplied by the same signs, and the second moments will get multiplied by uh, the pairwise product of the signs. Uh, so the moment ij, it will get multiplied by the sign bi times bj, right? Uh, and finally, uh, uh, you can uh, you can pick a subset of coordinates s, and then look at only uh, the first and second moments uh, inside this uh, subset. Okay. So if you have a subset of size t, 
then it amounts to projecting this vector uh, to dimension uh, t plus t choose 2, right? So the t first moments and t choose 2 second moments. Uh, these are the first and second moments which are all uh, inside the coordinates in the set S, okay? So you are allowed to do these three operations. Uh, and of course, you can do all these three operations uh, simultaneously. Uh, so you can fix a set S, subset of coordinates. You can fix a permutation pi uh, of uh, coordinates in this set. You can uh, pick a vector B. Uh, this is the vector of the signs, uh, plus minus signs that you can multiply with. Okay, uh, And then if you have a lambda, which is a measure on the whole polytope, uh, you get this measure called lambda sub s comma pi comma b, uh, which is uh, the measure obtained by applying all these three operations uh, to the to the uh, to the global measure lambda. Okay, and when I say you apply these operations to the measure, you really apply these operations to each point uh, in the support of this measure. Okay, uh, and now you get this new measure lambda sub s pi b. Uh, which is now uh, uh, it's a measure on uh, uh, lower dimensional subspace. Okay, if the set has size t, then it's a measure on uh, subspace of dimension uh, t plus t choose two. Okay, so yeah, let's hope uh, that it's uh, it was at least somewhat clear. Uh, and now uh, we are ready to state the characterization. Uh, so recall that f is the predicate. I can write it in uh, in its Fourier transform as uh, rho of f, which is the density, uh, plus uh, some uh, uh, the the non-constant part of the Fourier expression, right? Uh, which I can write in the increasing order of the size of the set. So it's some t equal to one to k, uh, sum of uh, Fourier coefficient f hat s times uh, the monomial. So that's simply the Fourier representation of the predicate. And now here is the characterization that the predicate is approximation resistant. Uh, if and only if there is a probability major lambda on the polytope C of F, uh, such that uh, for every set size T, uh, one, two, three, up to K, uh, 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 there is this linear combination of uh, measures uh, which identically vanishes, okay? So maybe you just want to stare a little bit uh, at this expression. Uh, so this is a big sum. Uh, so fix a set of size t, permutation pi on this set, uh, a vector b, which is the, uh, the, the plus minus signs you can multiply with. And then once you fix s pi and b, uh, you have this projected measure, right? Lambda sub s pi b. And then it is this combination of these projected measures. Uh, with some coefficients which involve uh, Fourier coefficients of the predicate and uh, the product of all these signs, uh, bi's. Uh, so it's a signed linear combination of measures uh, and it identically vanishes, okay, uh, as a signed measure. Uh, and just to emphasize, uh, if you are looking at uh, level t, uh, then uh, each of these lambda sub s pi b is a measure on uh, t plus t choose two dimensional vectors. Uh, so each lambda sub s pi b, uh, I mean, so you can take linear combination of these measures. Uh, so so you're not adding apples and oranges uh, in this linear combination, right? You are only adding apples. Uh, but then the combination has both positive and negative coefficients, right? And then as a measure, it the whole thing identically vanishes uh, for each level t. Uh, so it's some sort of symmetry requirements on the overall global major lambda. Uh, and if there is such a major lambda, then the predicate is resistant. Okay, so uh, yeah, I mean, I don't expect to somehow clearly see through these conditions, uh, but even if you get some kind of sense, general sense, uh, that's probably good enough for this uh, talk. Uh, okay, so I guess uh, I can uh, stop uh, uh, and uh, go if people are interested. I have a question. Maybe before we go on, so you, uh, let's see if there are any questions, uh, and then maybe proceed if you want to some more technical uh, discussions. Uh, are there any questions for now? I have a question. Yeah. So, yeah. how efficiently can you test for this condition? Yeah. So this I kind of said before that uh, uh, we don't know whether this condition is even decidable. 
so so we don't have an algorithm uh, forget about the running time of the algorithm even uh, we don't have an algorithm which can actually check whether uh, there exists uh, such a major lambda so for example could you sort of even if k is very small you know two or three could you then maybe how to say this simple enough so you can actually solve it that like, uh, even... yeah so we are were, we were not so interested in kind of for some specific things uh, uh because even that will maybe require writing some sort of program which uh, uh we were not uh, brave enough to do so mm. uh but that's uh, an excellent open problem uh, uh i mean i would believe that uh, uh, there is it is decidable so that's a open problem to show that this condition is decidable yeah any, yeah any more questions any any more questions Okay. Uh, I see. I see they've been there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so the K here is in in like in the kind of measures. Or let's see. The K for the function that you're testing is the same as the cardinality of the predicate. Is oh yeah. K, K is the arity of the predicate. So if you are lo looking at some predicate of arity, let's say five, mm -hmm. uh, then it's a at least. Uh, it appears to be a very simple problem you have some polytope in some 20 25 dimensions and you are and some set of five conditions uh yeah because i'm wondering it does mean that uh, the rounding function only has to uh, you only have to project into five dimensions if you care about predicate yeah yeah so, yeah so actually our our whole proof actually gives the following result that if it's a predicate predicate of arity k then the rounding function needs to be only of uh, dimension the projection only needs to be on dimension k plus 1 mm -hmm. i see that's very nice okay. yeah so the, our result gives that yeah now and could you hope that this measure is sort of uh, smooth in some way or uh yeah w w we don't know anything so just to add a small comment uh, can yeah. you hear yeah the shakar's question so like previous results the measure was just a single point right in, uh, all zero for example in uh, austrian mosel and uh, if it's if it's uh, measure is finitely supported then all these conditions just become a system of linear equations on the probability on the entries uh, which describe the measure and then you can test everything but uh, so i mean in fact we would hope to prove something like if you want decidability we would hope to prove that the measure can only always be finitely supported and then it would not be smooth in fact uh, necessarily not so but um, it would in fact be very concentrated on few points uh any more questions so what what do you mean by finitely supported you, you only have finitely many points or no 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 it's, it's a measure on the polytope right so the polytope uh, is infinite it's a measure on the points in the polytope it's not a measure uh, on the vertices or anything so it's it's a it's a measure on an infinite infinite space yeah so any more questions so much can you maybe uh, say again the last thing you said so um this this condition you have is equivalent if i understood correctly to saying that uh for all t from 1 up to k um You know, that sum is zero, identically, right? Yeah. And um, can you, like, for the existing, for the, ex the existing approximation resistance result, can you put them in this framework? So you said you know what the distribution looks like. It's also always on a point. Yeah, yeah. So, so in in all known approximation resistance results. Uh, Uh, of course uh, they they will show that uh, there is this probability major lambda uh, but then it's always it's a major which is concentrated at one single point in this body in all the known results so even something like the hypergraph linearity test yeah 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 sure and that even includes like all these measures which or all these cases which were identified by host Right sure, in sure. the big okay uh well i haven't looked at his paper but i would believe so okay i i strongly believe so okay okay any more questions 
Uh, yes, maybe one more thing. So you, you said you only need to project down into dimension k plus one. Does this mean that you can improve on the runtime of this steurer Raghavendra algorithm or...? or? Uh, well, I guess in some sense, yes, uh, or maybe in some sense, no. Uh, 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 so there is a one very subtle point in the sense that uh, uh, what our proof gives is that if uh, if there is an algorithm which which is better than uh, uh, which is better than the density rho of f then there is also an algorithm which projects down only to k plus 1 dimensions okay okay but still uh, that might not be the optimal algorithm you might not be able to beat the threshold rho of f by the optimal amount oh so there is a subtle point i see i see Okay. So, Vash, maybe you you, uh, you could comment about the history of this because uh, earlier you had something um, characterizing a slightly different notion uh, of approximation yeah, resistance. Yeah. I'm just so, wondering if it's the same characterization. Yeah, yeah. So, for for those who heard this, at least some version of this talk before, uh, uh, about six to eight months ago, uh, we had a characterization of a somewhat rel slightly related notion called strong approximation resistance. Uh, uh, yeah, but then it turned out that we were just missing uh, one uh, one important trick. Uh, and then it turns out that the same characterization actually applies to also to this the standard notion of approximation resistance. Uh, and now uh, what it means is that now we know that actually approximation resistance and what we called before as strong approximation resistance, uh, they're actually equivalent, uh, which is actually rather surprising. Uh, Can you define strong approximation resistance? Uh, uh, let's not uh, get into kind of, uh, well, I could if you want, but it will just kind of get us into deeper and deeper into, uh, uh, so should I define it or? Uh, okay, so uh, okay, so what uh, what this means now is the following: that uh, uh, so now we know that strong resistance and resistance are equivalent. Uh, this amounts to saying the following: so take a predicate which is approximation resistant. Uh, so therefore, there is a reduction from Unigame's problem to uh, uh, to this CSP, where in the yes case the instance is almost satisfiable. And in the no case, no assignment satisfy, satisfies rho plus epsilon fraction of the constraints, right? Uh, but now we have an even additional property that in the no case, uh, take any assignment, it satisfies no more than rho plus epsilon fraction of the constraints, and it does not satisfy even less than rho minus epsilon fraction of the constraints. So every assignment satisfies precisely rho fraction of the constraints, not more or not less. Okay, so this is the stronger property that you get from from the reduction. So that's what it means. So does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? So we can uh, yeah, we can do whatever the speaker decides to do. We can continue, or whatever the audience wants, we can continue with some more details. Or so much. What, what do you feel like doing? That? Uh, well, I could maybe in maybe seven eight minutes, I could just show maybe three more slides and at least give some some at some level idea of what we did. Uh, and of course, I mean people are uh, welcome to leave, but yeah. Uh, so should we proceed or? That sounds good. Is there are some other questions about definition before we proceed? Okay. Uh, so okay. So let's proceed. Uh, so uh, uh, so this is the high level power structure of the proof. Uh, so let's even say that somehow I pulled this characterization out of a hat, right? Uh, and now I want to show that uh, if uh, uh, if this major lambda, uh, uh, let's call it vanishing major. Uh, so we want to show that if such vanishing major lambda x is, 
then uh, the predicate is hard, right? That you can show approximation resistance. Uh, and actually, at, at least conceptually, that part is uh, not so difficult. Uh, it's uh, user standard PCP ideas. On the other hand, we would like to show that if no such major lambda x is, then uh, you get an algorithm, OK? Uh, but in fact, uh, we don't know how to, how to show this. Uh, and we do it uh, rather uh, in indirect fashion. Uh, so what we do is we define a certain uh, two-prover uh, zero-sum game between a hardness player and algorithms player. Uh, so this game has a value, uh, which is non-negative. Uh, and then if the value of the game is strictly positive, we show that uh, you get uh, uh, an algorithm. Uh, on the other hand, if the value, that part is straightforward. And if the value is 0, then we show that it leads to, by some uh, somewhat uh, uh, complicated sequence of uh, uh, steps, uh, to existence of uh, this vanishing major lambda. Uh, and then that leads to the hardness result, as I said before. Uh, so that's kind of the overall uh, picture. Uh, and it's a good open problem to show that uh, uh, if there is no major lambda, to show directly uh, that there is an algorithm. So that we leave as open. So that's the high level plan. Uh, so what's this uh, two player game? Uh, so this is a play the game between the hardness player and the algorithms player. Uh, so just to recall, look at the lower part of the slide. Uh, so it shows this CSP instance as the hypergraph. Uh, and the instance, the, as we said, the SDP solution has these local distributions, right? So there is this distribution mu for some constraint, uh, mu prime for some other constraint, mu double prime for yet another constraint, and so on and so forth, right? And for each of these mu's, we have this vector called zeta of mu, uh, which is the vector of uh, first and second movements, right? Uh, so look at these vectors, zeta of mu, zeta of mu prime, zeta of mu double prime, and so on. Uh, and these are the points uh, in this polytope, uh, C of f, right? Now, if you have m constraints in the CSP, you have these m points uh, in this polytope C of f. Uh, now, take the uniform measure on these m points and call it lambda, OK? So now lambda is this measure on the polytope, uh, which, which is really capturing uh, what the instance is, CSP instance is, right? Uh, now, we seem to be forgetting a lot of information about the CSP, in particular, the hypergraph structure of the CSP. Okay, But uh, rather surprisingly, it turns out to be fine. Uh, uh, you just look at this major lambda uh, and think of it as the instance of the CSP. Okay, And that's what is going to be the strategy of the hardness player in this game. So strategy of the hardness player is lambda, which is some major uh, on the body C of f. Okay. Uh, so this is not necessarily the vanishing measure that we will be ultimately looking for. Uh, so that will come eventually. Uh, but right now, it's some arbitrary measure on the polytope C of f, and that's what the strategy of the hardness player. Now, for the algorithms player, we noted that the algorithm really corresponds to picking this rounding function called psi, right? Uh, uh, the function on r to the d. And that's what the strategy of the algorithm player is. Uh, just play the rounding function. And then the payoff, uh, and the payoff will be viewed from the viewpoint of the algorithms player. The payoff is simply the uh, how well the rounding function performs on the instance given by lambda. Okay, so that's what the payoff is. Uh, so just to state what I said in words, uh, so such a game, uh, similar game was also used by O'Donnell and Wu uh, previously, but in a limited context of uh, max cut. Uh, so as I said. The hardness player strategy is this lambda, which is a probability major on the body polytope C of f. Algorithms player, uh, his strategy is this rounding function psi. Uh, and then the payoff is simply uh, look at the fraction of the constraints satisfied by this rounding psi uh, right, uh, uh, on the instance lambda. And you subtract this row of f, which is, in some sense, the trivial quantity, right? So you look at the advantage over the uh, the trivial threshold row of f. And that's what the payoff function is, OK? And that's what the this defines the game. Uh, and now this game has uh, what is called the value of the game. Uh, and uh, it turns out that the value is non-negative. Uh, so it's either strictly positive or it is identically 0. Now uh, let's look at the case where the value is strictly positive. Uh, now, if the value is strictly positive, 
it basically amounts to saying that the algorithms player has a strategy which irrespective of what the hardness player strategy is meaning irrespective of what the instance is uh, it the algorithm has performance which is at least equal to this value right which is positive uh, so positive advantage over the threshold row of f okay meaning there is an algorithm which always does strictly better than the trivial threshold row of f okay and therefore you get an algorithm uh, uh, and the predicate is approximable okay so this is completely straightforward so what we really want to show is uh, what happens when the value of the game is uh, identically zero uh, so let me kind of skip this slide uh, is maybe we don't have that much time uh, so what we do is that if, when the value of the game is identically zero uh, we look at uh, the actual expression for the payoff function uh, and turns out that the payoff function uh, whatever it looks uh, uh, as shown in the slide uh, and you want to think of this payoff function as a polynomial in the values of the rounding function psi okay so note that psi is a function on the continuous space r to the d right uh, so there is a variable called psi of y for uh, each value of this function at every point in the real space uh, right so it's a polynomial uh, it's a un polynomial in uncountable number of variables uh, but when the value of the game is zero what it amounts to saying is that the hardness player has a strategy call that strategy lambda uh, such that no matter what psi algorithms player plays the payoff is upper bounded by zero okay uh, so to state again that there exists lambda such that this expression which is shown here is upper bounded by zero no matter what size okay and then uh, we use this uh, observation that if you have a polynomial a multilinear polynomial uh, which is always upper bounded by zero no matter what its values are uh, then it is identically zero uh, so we conclude that uh, this polynomial is identically zero and therefore we can look at the coefficients of this polynomial uh, and all the coefficients must be zero and turns out that these coefficients are uh, integrals of certain Gaussian density functions uh, with respect to certain signed majors uh, and this signed major is precisely equal to uh, this linear combination of majors uh, that we uh, talked about before uh, which appears in the statement of the characterization uh, so you get this condition that uh, that uh, this integral of these Gaussian density functions uh, is zero uh, for each such Gaussian density functions that can arise uh, in this context okay uh, so what you get is that you have these signed majors such that integral of every Gaussian density function is zero and the class of these functions is rich enough right that uh, if you have an integral of uh, let's say every function every integral of every function is zero right with respect to a certain major then the major itself has to be identically zero right so you have these uh, standard facts from major theory and we conclude therefore that uh, each of these signed major is identically zero right uh, which is precisely what our condition was that there is this major lambda uh, such that uh, each of these uh, uh, linear combination of measures is zero uh, and but of course this requires a fair amount of work uh, jumping through lots of hoops and so on and so forth uh, but that's the high level view uh, and to conclude uh, uh, we can do more things such as give characterization for predicates uh, if the instances are k partite uh, characterizations if you look only at some restricted families of linear programs like Sherali Adams linear programs uh, another nice thing to do we can do though we don't kind of uh, include it in our uh, write up of the paper is that uh, we can give an alternate and in my view uh, some kind of more direct and illuminating uh, exposition to this raghavendra's paper which shows equivalence between unique games hardness and integrality gap and we can extend it to non boolean predicates mixture of predicates so on and so forth though we don't do it on our paper because it's already complicated enough for boolean predicates uh, as I said, the, uh, the open question is whether our characterization is decidable, whether this vanishing major lambda, if it exists, then whether you can always say that it's only supported on bounded number of points. Uh, 
you can look at some specific families of predicates such as linear threshold predicates uh, and another very nice question that me and Pratik, uh, we already have some partial progress on, is uh, the approximation resistance when the instance is given to be perfectly satisfiable as opposed to near satisfiable. Uh, and this actually is a completely different ball game and quite uh, interesting in my opinion. Uh, and finally, the dichotomy conjecture. Uh, this is open for uh, alphabets which is non-Boolean. And maybe uh, we can now f uh, 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 well, not necessarily because of this our result, but uh, for maybe some other reasons, maybe we can hope that uh, we can uh, make some progress on dichotomy conjecture. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Subhash. Uh, any other questions? Oh. <laughs> any other questions from the audience? Yeah, we had. Um, What's the um, Characterization for the Shirali atoms is it equally difficult to state, or is there some? Uh, yeah, so it's 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 basically identical. If you look at uh, only the uh, uh, the first moments and completely ignore the second moments, it's it's identical. Yeah. That might be easier to make decidable first. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. And. Um, How, the the K plus one. Did you say where where it shows up? I mean, you said it shows up somehow in the uh, in the, the zero sum game there. But did you say exactly how? Uh, what shows up? The, the K plus one. How come you get the dimension K plus one? Uh, Is it really obvious? Uh, it no 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 no. It comes out somewhere deep down in the proof. But it's in the game. You see it from the game. Uh, uh, no. So in fact, we define our game only for those K plus one dimensional rounding strategies. Uh, and then, throughout the in the proof, at I some see. point we realize that that is enough. So. I see. I see. Oh, probably enough for these Gaussian measures to, uh, from them to conclude that the measure is identically yeah. zero. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? So uh, we can still stay here. Uh, uh, soon stop the uh, YouTube broadcast. I should just uh, thank uh, all of you here. I should also thank the read about 10 uh, viewers on YouTube. So uh, I don't know who you are, but thanks for joining us there. Uh, if you have any comments, uh, both those on YouTube and those that are watching us here inside, uh, send me an email. Uh, and I should also thank the speaker uh, for uh, bearing with us. We had lots of technical trouble uh, yesterday. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, yeah, actually, as a technologically, essentially illiterate person, I find this as a miracle that uh, it seemed to have gone through. Yeah, it actually went, I think, the, uh, one of the smoothest we had so far. It's probably mainly thanks to Thomas Solinson, who was here in the background and doing all the magic. Uh, so it really went, uh, this technologically, I think it went quite smoothly. It's the first time, I think, we don't have any uh, crashes in, <laughs> in the middle of Google Hangout. So, That's thanks again, everyone. Uh, if there are no other questions, I'll go uh, turn off the broadcast, but you're welcome to stay here and uh, bother Subash with more questions. Okay, good night. And in two weeks, Shubangi will give a TCS class talk. <laughs>